Hello again. Yes, this is my third time. First time was astronomical iconology on ancient coinage. I know that sounds kind of long-haired, but it was a fun topic. I collect ancient coins. I have several collections. Uh, the one collection of ancient coins from 550 BC to about 2,000 years ago that had uh, imagery, symbolism, uh, stars, planets, comets, things like that on ancient coins and then we would look into there and try and find out why, what did they look at? What can we attribute it to? Did a comet happen that year? Was there a supernova? What was it? That was my first presentation and I still continue doing that and growing that collection. Second was meteorites. I think that was popular. I brought lots of meteorites and uh, other signs of impacts around the country. And another one of my collections for later, if anyone's interested, I collect Viewmasters. <laughs> you all remember those, right? Come on, you're my age, right? You know these things, right? And in this one, this is a Model D. This is a rare one. Uh, it took me a while to get my hands on one of these ones. It's Bakelite and it's brown. The reel that's in here right now is astronomy. And actually a couple of the shots you'll see today are in here. They're not my shots, they're commercial shots, but this is really fun. So if you wanna come up later, especially if you're a Viewmaster collector or astronomy, come on up and take a look in this. It's got a self light in it. You don't have to put it up to lights. And it's got some really interesting shots in it. So today we're gonna to talk about Casper's Park. And I've been a, a volunteer there. This will be my 24th year and we'll discuss how that happened. It's star parties plus the, the park itself is a really wonderful park to visit. We have members from the Casper's Park Foundation here, Spencer, you, you can talk with later if you're interested in going out to the park or even being a volunteer like myself. And we have members from uh, Leisure World here who actually take part in these star parties and they may even show up in these pictures. I always start off most of my astronomy things with this particular slide. Does anyone know what's going on with that picture? It's an unretouched picture. It was done with film years ago at Casper's. Can you tell what's going on? It's a time exposure, of course. I put camera open time exposure. It's about 20 minutes on the horizon. So you see the star tracks, right? As the earth turns, the stars leave star trails behind. This, oh, pardon me. See that one bright light? That's Jupiter. This is Saturn. And this is the Pleiades star cluster. And then that, that says hi, was me walking into the 20 minute exposure with my little red flashlight with my hand over it and went down out there, took it off, drew high and then walked out of the picture. Okay. We can have fun at start parties, right? Okay, so here I am, that's my telescope. And I've, like I said, I've been doing this for 24 years now too. This is me at, uh, pardon me, Adventure Day at Casper's too. And that's coming up in April. If anyone would like to drop out to Casper's Park, it's on a Saturday, April the 4th. April the 4th, drop out. We have lots of these booths. I'll be there. We'll talk about star parties and there's lots of other people um, with all, with wild animals, representing all the uh, other parks, things like that. It's just a really good event. And for those who don't really know where Casper's Park is, if you can see this map, this is the five freeway. And here is the Ortega Highway, the 74. Okay, so you just go to the 74 and go inland uh, seven miles and that's why we have such good skies out at Casper's because we're seven miles away from the city and up into the up into the hills a little bit so you don't get as much marine layer and you don't get as much uh, ambient light and our skies are really good if you come out in the summer I guarantee you you'll see the Milky Way 
And other than star parties, there's a lot to see in Casper's. The wildlife is amazing, even if you like these guys. I took this picture in August. It's mating season for tarantulas. Come on out, it's fun for the whole family, right? A lot of, I mean, from oak trees to cactus, and there's deer everywhere, and this is back at the corral, they call it, uh, butterflies. And this is up at the top where the uh, ranger station is, and that's where we hold the star parties. So there I am, a couple of night things. This is um, Fred Donnelly. He takes some absolutely amazing um, astrophotography. A few of his photos will be here later. And who are these guys? <laughs> <laughs> Those two right there, they come out. And then this is a, a different Fred who comes out and helps out. At the star parties, we average somewhere between three and seven telescopes. That's about what averages. And Val, he's here all the time. I think his picture pops up every now and then. This is Casper's Park itself up at the ranger station here. So if you come in off the Ortega Highway, you'll go through the ranger station, then you'll fall this road to a stop sign, you'll come up the hill, and this is where the star party will be, up at the top by the ranger station, but you'll park down here and then just walk up, it's, it's not far. If you have a hard time walking, you can drive up. We do have a few handicap spots. Um, but I think there's only like about three that will accommodate you if you can't walk up there yourself. So how did I start doing star parties at Casper? Because I've been doing astronomy. I've been doing astronomy for between 20 and 30 years before that. So the answer is comets. Okay, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? But take a look at the date of Comet Hayakutake. March 25th, 1996. Me and my brother-in-law, Stan, we went out to Casper's to photograph Comet Hayakutake. And Stan says, I think Casper's is gonna be a really good spot to take photos of this particular comet. So I shot one in black and white. The comet's not too bad. And then I shot one in color so I could catch the aquamarine of the comet. And while we were there, we noticed a park ranger setting up a telescope over on a round compass-shaped uh, platform. And he put the scope out there and was setting stuff up. So I just kind of walked over to see what was going on. His name was Stan Bankson. He was a ranger at the park at the time. And we started talking about telescopes and eyepieces. We were trading eyepieces that night, trying to look at different uh, views of the comet that particular night, et cetera, and taking photographs. Then while I was over there at his telescope, on his radio came like an emergency call. There was some commotion at the back of the park. And he says, I'm sorry, I have to leave and run to take care of this. Can you sort of take over this event for me? And I said, yeah, I guess. He didn't come back. So 24 later, I'm still doing it. I'm waiting for him to come back. But actually, I talked to him a lot. But that's how, it, that's, that's how it happened. He says, you know what you're doing. You know, just bring your scope and do the same thing. Just show everybody the sky. So ever since then, we've been doing star parties every Saturday nearest the new moon. So every month, uh, weather permitting, of course. Plus, we do other special events. Eclipses, transits, things like that. And then if uh, it's National uh, uh, Day of Astronomy, happens twice a year, then we'll kind of move the Star Party Day around to accommodate that. We'll stay on comets for a while since we got started that way. This is hale Bop, happened the next year. And I took these shots April 25th, 1997 at Casper's. Again, this one, oh, pardon me, this one, in black and white, and this one in color. Um, you can kind of see the Casper's background. In this particular one, you can see hale Bob there, but that's my brother-in-law, Stan, and that's his son. And I illuminated my tripod and then the 10-inch Dobsonian, Dobsonian telescope, so you can kind of see it in there. It's kind of bright in here, it's hard to see, but 
the shot actually did come out okay. Then, in 2007, Comet Homes came by. And a lot of people didn't know about it because it wasn't really bright, but I went out there one night on a Wednesday with Fred Donnelly just to get some photographs of it. And lo and behold, Comet Homes, for whatever reason, gassed out for two hours. And guess, we were there right at that particular time. So we got this photograph. And the, the comet itself is just in the middle, but it gassed out. And across um, this whole, this is larger than the full moon. It was a really long, big comet, but it only lasted a couple of hours. And, and Fred and I happened to be there at that exact moment. It was just pure luck. And then this one, it might be a little bit hard to see. This is Comet Panstars, happened in 2013. You can see we're from Caspers. We're looking uh, west over the ocean out there. And you can see a very young new moon. And there's little Panstars right there. So we had to catch it just before it would set in, in the west. And this is a really good shot that my friend Peter Myers took out at Caspers. It's Comet Jacques. And it's kind of deceiving, but these are blue stars, but they're Jacques. And it's just a little wee guy like that. He has an excellent uh, set of equipment that puts a very large camera on like a tripod that's very much like a telescope and it takes really long. So this is a 90 minute exposure. Okay, eclipses, fun subject, especially when it comes to Caspers. First of all, there's two types, solar and lunar, and then there's transit. You know what transit are, right? Mercury or Venus will go in front of the sun, right? Not enough to change the volume of the sun, so they call them transits instead of an eclipse. This was Christmas morning 2000. This was my Christmas gift I got. I took my telescope out first thing uh, Christmas morning, year 2000 to Casper's, and I caught this partial eclipse. Look at all the sunspots at this time. There was quite a bit during that, that, that time. At the moment, there's not many sunspots if you're looking at the sun. There's virtually none at all. And then this one in 2012, took it at Casper's. I put the photos on at different times. And you could see there's... Uh, just a little wee couple of sunspots, but not much. It's an annular eclipse, it means it's going to look like a ring if you're in the area of totality, but uh, Casper's wasn't right on that area, so the most we would get would be 87%. But it was still a really good day. A lot of people came out for that particular one. We got a lot of really good photographs. Oh yeah, just a minute, I'll tell you what that is. At the end of this day, uh, the sun was going to set while it was still being eclipsed. It was going to go behind the hills and then set over the ocean, but it was still being eclipsed, but you know, we couldn't see the end of it. And we're putting stuff away, and at that particular time, the marine layer started rolling in and up and over the hills, and this miracle happened. I took that with a camera, that's not with a telescope. All I did was I stood there, took the, took the Nikon 1J1 with just a little bit of a long lens, and I took that picture. One of my favorite shots, and it's not hooked to anything. So what does this tell you? That the ancients knew that the moon would go in front of the sun, right? Because they could see this too. It would happen, I mean, the Mayans knew about eclipses, right? Two to 3,000 years ago. But look at this, this is just with our own eye. The marine layer that came over the hill at Caspers acted as a natural filter. And look how beautiful that sun is. And it's clearly being eclipsed, right? But it's round. So they knew, the ancients would know that that's the moon in front of it. Okay, the solar eclipse of 2017, the big one. Um, I was gonna go to Casper, Wyoming, but some things changed, so I decided to stay here and just hold a star party. And our star parties have gotten pretty popular lately, so we, didn't, we don't put them on the website. 
uh, people just have to kind of know, okay, it's around the new moon Saturday, we'll go out. Anyway, the ranger at that time, Ben, he said, well, it's a Monday, kids are going back to school, look, it's August, it's a work day, I don't think too many people are gonna come out, let's just put it on the website. And I said, well, I don't think you should, but he did. And then someone at the Orange County Register found that out and put it in their newspaper. And then the morning of this particular uh, eclipse, I'm watching KTLA News, Channel 5, and they said, if you're in Orange County and you want to see the eclipse, go to Casper's Wilderness Park, find astronomer Alan White, and he'll show you this. And I went, oh, no. We got 1,500 people. Over the four hours, we had 1,500 people. They shut Casper's down. They couldn't admit any more cars. They quit at 468 cars. All the staff who wanted to come up and see the eclipse could not. They were down there taking care of cars. They started parking cars along the Ortega and all the way to the nursery, making them very angry. But that's how many people got. Look how solid that is. At the top of the hill, the entire area was full. Thank God. Val was there, and so was Fred. I did that, I, I'd, I'd been doomed. That's my scope there. So, that's my scope, and look. Uh, this is Val's, Val's and Fred's scopes, right, helping out. And I brought uh, a lot of glasses for people to use and filters so that they could put them in front of their cameras and take pictures of the sky. So there was that many people, but they all got to have a look. You know, they just took their time, they were orderly about it. Plus, you know, eclipses don't happen like in three minutes. It takes hours for it to go across. But it turned out okay. And I even met a little friend. Okay, so the Orange County Register was there too, taking photographs, lots of them. And in the newspaper, they only put Two photographs, one of the eclipse that I put the filter in front so she could take a shot of the sun being eclipsed. What do you think the other photograph was in the paper? A yeah, a parrot, right? <laughs> of course it's on me, but this is the other shot. On the website they had four or five shots, including this one, but this is the one that made it into the newspaper. Okay, lunar eclipses. And people call them blood moon. Why does it turn red? No, no, no. It's just that we, the Earth, eclipse in front of the moon. Like we're in between the sun and the moon, so our shadow blocks out the moon over a period of time, a couple of hours. And then once it's in totality, the uh, atmosphere around our planet, as the sun bends through it, turns the moon a little bit red. If you take a time exposure, this is about a I don't know, six second exposure, something like that. But you notice it does look a little bit red, right? Shot, I took it at Casper's. And here's the transit that was in 2006. You can see little wee Mercury going in front of the sun. Sunspots about 10 times larger. Sunspots are huge. And then this one. In November 11th, 2019, just a few months ago, this is my friend Richard's daughter, Arabella, up at the telescope taking a look. And there's Spencer. He's sitting right there. If you want to talk to him about volunteering at Casper's or visiting Casper's, he's the guy to talk to. Here's the shot I took, November 11th, 2019. Nikon 1J1 with 1 16th of a second, little mercury going across the face of the sun. And it took a long time for it to go across, except we got out there and there was this marine layer. We go, oh, I don't know if we're gonna see anything, but just that very last hour, it cleared out beautifully, and we got good looks like this. Casper's is good this way. Our solar system, this particular shot I'm um, piggybacking a Panasonic camera on the telescope and here a little thin crescent moon and that's Venus looking west out of Casper's Park. Um, 
It's a shot of Jupiter. Took it with Nikon 1J1. Um, amateur shot. Best I can do, but not too bad. This may be hard to see. I took this with my cell phone. That's Jupiter. That's Io. That's uh, Ganymede. That's Europa. And that's Callisto. With my cell phone. And you're probably wondering, well, how does this do that? I put the telescope up and I put a Celestron NXYZ on it. it. It moves in three planes. X is like this, Y this way, and then Z this way. Until you're square over the eyepiece and you could take shots like that. If you want to see a couple of them, I have them on this. Including that one. That's with a cell phone. Just under a billion miles away, I took it with a cell phone through my telescope. Modern technology, nice and easy, right? Inexpensive. And Mars. This is from a, a shot a few years ago as it came by. It's a little bit washed out in here, but at least you can see a little bit of the uh, polar ice cap on it. Mars is very, very difficult to shoot pictures of because it, it's so close, it's bright, and it waffles in the atmosphere. It's just really a difficult thing to shoot. I love this shot though. My friend, he lives in the same complex as I do in Laguna Niguel. His name's Carl Dadson, older fellow, really great guy. He came out on the 20th, we came out and he took this shot. Then we came out on the 21st and he took this shot. This little wee thing here that moved, that's Pluto. It's the only way you can tell for sure that it's Pluto because it's so small and so faint. So even in this shot here, you can see, see this one distant star Nothing's by it, but here now there's two of them. One of them was Pluto, moving in the sky. Taken at Casper's Park. Moon, always photogenic, no matter what time of day or year. This was out at Casper's Park with a cell phone. This one too, I took this one with Nikon 1J1, about, uh, again, a sixteenth of a second. And then this one, I decided to put a few labels on it because I really liked the way it came out. You can see the upper crater there with the uh, center lifting, that's Lungrenus. And these are all on the sea of um, f fertility, which is uh, Mare Fecunditatis. And there's Patavius Crater and Little Funarius Crater. I really like this one because there's 14 craters within that crater including this one here, which is Fernarius B. And it's hard to see, but there's a little rill there, it's called, that just joins that crater to the edge of the large crater. But that's 50 miles long. So these are really long, big impacts. I took this one with a cell phone. Came out OK, didn't it? It's on this, first hand. Photography's getting a lot easier out there. Okay, deep space stuff. This one, I like the stars of the constellation Orion. They're up there right now. It's uh, winter constellations. Rigel, bright blue star. Oh, and for Star Trek fans, Rigel, right? It's one of the episodes. Red Jet came from Rigel 3, Wasn't, isn't that correct? I think so. But Rigel is a triple star system. It's by itself and it has a binary twin uh, companions going around it. And on this particular night, I took a one minute exposure with Panasonic wide field and I managed to catch all three of the stars. Kind of a hard thing to do, but I was just pleased I caught it one night. This is shot by Moongi Kang. He has unfortunately moved back to Korea, but he was just an excellent. Uh, graphic uh, engineer and really knew how to do astrophotography. This is the Pleiades star cluster and the shot that he took. This is 90 minutes. Uh, you could see all the nebulosity in it. When we look at it with our eye, it looks like 
Pleiades star clusters looks like the seven sisters, like just seven stars to your eye. When you look through binoculars and telescope, there's 212 stars, but when you take a shot like that, you can see all the nebulosity. And Moon Gi Kang and I took this on a Wednesday evening at Casper's several years ago. And this one, Fred Donnelly took this shot. It's uh, M13, the great globular star cluster in the uh, constellation of Hercules. Um, if you know how Hercules is, if you see his, um, the only thing that he wears is like leather uh, skirt and on the leading edge, which is the westernmost edge between those two stars lies this particular object, which is M13. And it is over 100 stars in a ball. And some of them have planets, we know that they do. And there's been supernovas in there too. But if you were on a, living on a planet around one of those particular stars, your life would be nothing like what our life is here because there would be literally no, no nighttime, right? Too many stars around, it'd be perpetual day. So life, any life there would be quite different than from here. This shot again by Moon Gi Kang is uh, the Dumbbell Nebula, uh, M27, and it's in Volpecula. To me, it looks like an apple core that people took bites out of, right, doesn't it? Uh, actually, what it is, it's gonna be, it's a planetary nebula, and that's what our sun's going to do eventually. Our sun's, what, halfway through its life at about five billion years. Its outer layer is slowly going to drift out. It's going to swallow the inner planets. It's going to swallow us, and it's going to go almost out to the uh, orbit of Jupiter and be a huge bubble like this because it's actually a, a bubble. Uh, it's hard to see these ones out here, but that's what we're going to do. And Mungi took this shot out at Casper. And this one, one of my favorite of the great nebula in the constellation of Orion, very colorful. This is a three hour um, exposure. And you can see all the gas, the dust in there. Huge, huge thing. If you come out to our star parties, the time is right. Uh, this is up in the sky right now. And then Fred Donnelly took this great one. The horse head is so popular. Uh, for those who maybe don't know where the horse head is, you know the three stars in the belt of Orion? They're Alnitak, Alnit, Lam, and Mintaka. Uh, underneath Alnitak, which is the easternmost, the one on the left most, the uh, horse head descends from it. And then a little more east is the flame nebula. If you look in a telescope, you really won't see it. You'd have to have a, a bone at 18 or a larger telescope to actually see the horse head. I've seen it with my own eye in at 25. I, I could see that there. And the flame nebula, the only, the only way you could see that is with a uh, time exposure to catch it. And this is a really faint object, but it's a wonderful object. M1 Crab Nebula, it's in Taurus. It's a supernova remnant. Um, it exploded in the year 1054. If you were here from my discussion on ancient coinage, a coin came out in the year 1054 that had over uh, Constantine the Ninth, it had two stars, one on either side of his head. Because uh, when this supernova, people in China recorded it, and in Byzantine Empire, uh, late Roman Empire, they documented it well that they could see two suns in the sky during the day for 23 days. And that was in the year 1054. And now, we talked about Betelgeuse is ready to go soon, Aldebaran's ready to go. These are all stars that will supernova soon, probably within 10,000 years. I don't know how much time we have left. I'd like to see one live, because no one here has seen one live. I've seen four supernovas through my telescope of distant galaxies and stuff. But to see one live with your own eyes, the last time that's happened was the year 1054. So we figure, well, it happens about every thousand years or so. So if Betelgeuse goes soon, yep, it's about every thousand years or so that we, we can see. Except that if we talked about this, if Betelgeuse explodes, it's 10 times larger and it's 150 times closer. So we don't know what it's going to do. We don't think it's going to do anything harmful. It's just going to be big and bright for a long time. 
This is going to be really interesting. Hope it happens during my lifetime because I'll be taking lots of photographs. And Mungi took this shot. It's a really, really great shot. And then this one, one of the last shots I've got here is Fred took this. M31, the Great Galaxy in Andromeda. It's in the local group. All our local group, there are a few galaxies in it, and we're doing this dance around each other. All the other galaxies are moving away from us. This one's moving towards us. It's coming toward us at 65 miles per second, but don't worry, it's not gonna be here for 2.73 billion years. It's that far away. Because even, yeah, the light alone, it, it's 2.5 million light years away. So when we look at it through a telescope or take this picture, the light we just shot, it's two and a half million years old. So we have this little joke that we always end off our emails and stuff with, that we say the only good photon is an old one. You'll get that at about two in the morning. <laughs> he said it. And Fred got these great shots. The World Pro Galaxy, it's such a crowd pleaser, that one. And it looks like it's swallowing that one, that other galaxy beside me. They're not related to each other at all. It just happens to be way behind in the background. And it looks like it's world pulling it in, but it's not. And it's a nurse and major. And then this one, the sombrero, one of my favorite. But look at this huge dust one on the outside. It's very dramatic. So it's a really, really great uh, object to look at in the sky. Okay, so Caspers, we happen to have gotten a couple of awards. This one, and back in 2013, this is actually an international organization because we were consistently having star parties, at least one every month. We're inviting a lot of people out and looking at a lot of things. They declared us as California's first star park because we had dark skies and lots of activity and a lot of people were coming out to see it. And then we just got this one not too long ago. It's the neck pro where the National Association of County Park and Recreation, they uh, honored us by, through the star parties, drawing in uh, a, a large amount of the public who would probably not otherwise have gone to the park. And that's how we, we got that particular award. So, when's our next star parties? Because now you're all dying to go, right? Bring your cell phone. I'll put it right on my scope and we'll take a picture. You know, if it's a solar eclipse, bring your cell phone. I'll put a filter in front of it and we'll get a picture of an eclipse. No problem, it's easy these days. So, not this Saturday, but next Saturday's the next star party. Weather permitting, might be a little cold, but you can see Orion for sure. Uranus and Neptune will be up and I'm gonna try and drop the scope on both. They're fun objects to see. They're distant and they're small, but they're distant planets. Then in February on 22nd and on the 21st of March. These are all Saturdays closest to the new moon. So that makes it available for everyone to come and see. And I'm always there hour or two before sunset, setting stuff up, looking around too. So if you don't know the place that well, there's lots to do in Casper's Park. If you're bringing your grandkids or whatever, there's uh, playgrounds. Lots of hiking trails, lots of walking trails, right up at the uh, ranger station, right where we hold the party. There's a little uh, encountering nature trail that you can do, and it, it, there's good views from up there because we're at the uh, pinnacle of a hill, so we get really good uh, skies for the star party. And then we turn all the lights out of the ranger station. We don't allow headlights up there, so it's pretty dark. And your night vision will acclimate quickly and uh, you're not going to trip over everything and you're going to get to see lots through the telescope. And thank you and hope to see you out at Casper's. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? Can you repeat the dates? You want that back? Yeah. You're going to take a picture of it? Oops, 2020, sorry. Okay, that's wrong. 2020. 2020. Did you, did you pick that up? I did. Okay, they're all 2020s, these. Mr. Cunningham. I have a question for you, and I'm hoping you'll share this story about how you happened to meet 
um, Stephen Hawking at Disneyland. He wants, he wants me to tell me the, the Stephen Hawking story. I had already met him very briefly once at Universe uh, 1993 down in San Diego, but then just a few years ago, uh, not that long before he passed away, uh, I'm at Disneyland, I'm taking some photos, and I'm just walking by and then came this entourage with a wheelchair, and in the wheelchair is Stephen Hawking. And I went, okay. So I kind of backed up and I talked to the caregiver and I said, can I speak with Dr. Hawking for a second? And they said, no, we're not working today. And I said, mm, okay, darn. But just then they were wheeling him into the tiki room, you know, the tiki okay. room at Disneyland, right? And there's stairs there, so I didn't even know that there was, but there's a little elevator at the back on, on the side there. And they were trying to get him up there, family members and stuff, trying to get him up there. And they were having a hard time. So I kind of got in and got underneath and helped lift his chair up and stuff. Cause he looks just like you would think he was. He's in a large wheelchair. He's got a computer screen and just exactly as you'd think. So I helped them get it up. And then I was gonna leave, but then they closed the gate with me inside. And then she looked at me and she goes, okay, I'll give you a few seconds. So I just got on my down one day and I told him I read Brief History of Time and the Grand Design, both cover to cover, twice. And I told him about my star parties and stuff like that. And I said, I'm just really happy to meet you and stuff. And he did something underneath the cover and it said, uh, and then through the screen it said, thank you. And uh, that, that, that's, my, that's my Hawking story. Any other? Any other? Why is it called Casper? It's after Ronald uh, Casper's. Uh, it was he appropriated the land, right? I think Spencer knows that story, and he provided the land for the Casper. And it's the largest of all OC parks. It's huge. I mean, there's a lot of hike, and it goes all the way out to the hot springs. There's lots of hiking. There's lots of uh, uh, you can you know bike riding and there's a lot of equestrian out there too. And then there's the confluence, there's the rivers that go through, there's the arroyo toad when it gets wet out, lots of wildlife and stuff. It's a really great park. Any other questions? Again, go ahead. What's been the most rewarding thing for you about doing the star parties? Most rewarding thing for star parties? I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more story. This, this, this one's important to me. Way back when, uh, when uh, Stan was still the ranger at uh, Casper's. Uh, he called me up and said, do you want to do a special star party on a Wednesday? And I said, sure. And he said, <clears throat> it's going to be for inner city kids. And they said, uh, someone else will bring some inner city kids from Santa Ana. These are young kids aged like 12 to 16, something like that, who are border <clears throat> borderline gangbangers and they said we want them to see that there's something else outside the hood and can you just host a star party for them It'd be about six or eight and i said yeah sure we'll do it so we set up and saturn was out and i had the scope on saturn and a uh, little oc bus pulls up and out comes these kids and they were young but they weren't really kids they they had some rough edges too, and the one larger one, wearing the leather jacket and with the hands in the pockets, uh, came out, and they all seemed to look up to him, like kind of follow what his, what, whatever it was he was doing, and he looks up to me and I said, why don't you go into the scope and tell me what you think you see? And then so he just kind of rolled his eyes, he wasn't too interested, and he had his hands in his pocket, and he just went over to the eyepiece and looked like that and he didn't move for the longest time like he was looking and looking and i'm wondering can he see anything and then all of a sudden he goes shut up is that saturn and i said yes it is and then he said in spanish something to them and they all gathered around and they all started looking into the scope next thing they're all asking questions like uh how far away is it how does the scope work how, mu how much does the scope like this cost they're asking all the right questions and then over the next couple of months, they came out five or six times, something like that. And we hope 
that we showed them that there was something else outside their hood. You know, I don't know what happened after that, but it, it was just a good moment for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I want to say we've been going to Casper's for a few months now, and we really appreciate uh, all the work that you've done there and making us feel really comfortable because it's really a beautiful place to observe the stars. So we can't thank you enough. Okay, great. Anytime. I love doing it too. See, it's uh, <coughs> I don't really feel like I'm giving away my time or anything because as a volunteer, I'm enjoying it myself too. You know, I get to do photography, I get to meet people, we're talking astronomy, you're up at the outdoors, you know, I'm listening to the three different frogs that are out there, I can listen to different cr crickets, I can hear animals, and, you know, coyotes in the background and stuff. It's very enjoyable for myself too. I don't feel like I'm, you know, working or giving away my time. I just really enjoy it. And if anyone else wants to come on out and do the same, please do. We know we need more people to help out all the time. Any more questions? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Where do you think astronomy and space exploration is headed in the next 10 years? They're going to physically start going out there. They're going to go to Mars, they're going to go to the moon, they're going to start going to Europa, they're going to start going to really, really cool places. And because why? It's competitive now, it's because now they're making it a business, right? instead of just NASA and funding, people, you know, like Elon Musk and these people, they really have a desire to get out there and through, you know, their means and stuff like that, I think it's gonna happen pretty soon. I mean, they're even booking flights to the moon now, right? That's gonna happen in 2024 and stuff, you know. I can't afford to go, I wanna go, you know, but we'll, we'll see. A quarter million. Yeah. I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Either about the park itself or astronomy in general? Anything? Well, I don't want to scare people, but what about the mountain lions? Mountain lions, there, there's been incidents with mountain lions out there, but those are mostly in the past. I've never seen one all that time I've been there. I've never laid my eyes on a mountain lion live. I've seen bobcats, but they're kind of cool. They just come out and check out what's going on. I've seen the gray foxes, uh, all, all manner of little animals. I saw a long-tailed weasel, but I've never seen a mountain lion, not ever. Is there camping allowed? Camping, of course, oh yeah, yeah. But you have to book that ahead. So a lot of the campers, they come up, oh, but what's, what's the rule if you're a camper and you're coming up to astronomy? You have to bring the astronomers some more. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's what it costs. They always forget though. But every now and then someone remembers. Astronomers get hungry too, come on. Any other questions? Come on. If it's an astronomy question, I don't know the answer, I'll just make something up. Oh, you mean the, uh, yeah. the uh, Adventure Day? Whatever yeah, it's on the 4th, that's a Saturday, right? Yeah, and there's going to be lots of kiosks with a lot of like outdoorsy representatives and stuff like that. I'll be there and OC parks and people like with the wild animals and the birds, you know, like the raptor birds and stuff like that too. I always go over there too because they have little like live owls and eagles and things like that too. It's really, really great to see. We went out one time when they had of yeah. That's really terrific too and I've spoken with them too because I'm very much interested in native culture and uh, we go to a lot of the sites out and he kind of tells me where events are and stuff like that and he has the, uh, the Pueblo like the uh, little home in San Juan Capistrano I think and it's open on weekends too and he comes out uh, to Adventure Day too. Pardon? Yeah, I'm trying, yeah, yeah, because I'm forgetting his name right now, too, yeah. Stephen Rios, his grandmother gave the name to the Rios district of wow. Capistrano. See, and you get a lot of these people, and then there's, a, there's live music, and there's, you know, games and events for the kids and stuff, too. It's, it's, a, really, it's a really good event. Yes? 
Casper's Park is, okay, do you know where the 74 is? Uh, the Ortega Highway in San Juan Capistrano? Like, you know, you go south of San Clemente, is, I mean, pardon me, uh, before you get to San Clemente, San Juan Capistrano, is, it's the 74, and you're just gonna go seven miles inland, like towards the hills. Now, have you ever had trips from here, like we have a, a bus or something going? I don't know of any that were organized from Leisure World, but imagine they could. Yeah, see, it can be rained, yeah. That would be a great thing, yeah. Yeah, because it's really not that far. You know, I live in Laguna de Gal. For me, it's just, boom, you know, 20 minutes and I'm out there. So all the new moon nights, eclipse nights, all those, that's where you'll find me. Yeah, what is the most distant object you've seen through your telescope? Through my telescope, most distant? Mm, well, very, very distant galaxies. Um, they're going to be in the magnitude of thousands of um, millions of light years. Because uh, my scope, well, it's only a Mead LX10, but you mean, I mean, you see the great nebula, I mean, the great galaxy in Andromeda, pretty large. But behind that, you're seeing a lot of small galaxies, and they're, they're in the magnitude of hundreds of millions of miles away. So it, it can see pretty deep. Hard to photograph, though, because it's not much light. But we like to look at the brighter stuff that people can recognize, like Saturn. I love when people look in that scope. They see Saturn. You don't tell them. And they're, oh, wow. Did you put, like, a postcard on the front of the scope, you know? No, I said, oh, you're looking, you're looking at it live, you know, that's it. That's real. So what would be a career path for an astronomer? A career path for an astronomer? Yeah, that's tough. These days, um, they're actually trying to build um, the programs at the various universities because a lot of people don't go into it because it's not really, you know, it's not a real growth field, astronomy I itself. Although I do see that more and more women are going into physics, astrophysics and stuff like that too. And they seem, you know, the ones that I've spoken to that really seem to have an aptitude for it. I'm very pleased with that because it used to be a guy's network before, right? Now you see a lot more women coming into it. And I took some astronomy at Saddleback and Fullerton off campus and stuff like that. And they have wonderful programs out there. Applied astronomy and then observational astronomy. That's really good. You'll do star parties, you know, and you're gonna learn the sky. If you come out to our star parties, I have a laser that you can actually see the stream in the sky. We'll draw out the constellations for you. So you'll know what you're looking at in the sky and what objects we're looking at. We'll go deep into that. My favorite constellation is in like July, August, is Scorpio. Oh, yeah. And how many people around here have never recognized that particular constellation and it's so big and it's so cool to see. Especially when you draw it out, you hear the gasp in the crowd. And I said, you want me to draw that one more time so you'll remember, yep, yep. You, draw that. you can't miss that tail on that stinger. It's huge, but it's a beautiful constellation. Orion's neat, but it's obvious. Scorpio's better. Come on out in the summer, I'll show you. It's my favorite. Isn't it? Scorpio? Yeah. Scorpius, pardon me. Right? And it has uh, Antares, its heart, right? Red giant star in there. Antares, it means the opponent of Mars because Mars is actually Ares. So Antares, the star, it's red, looks just like Mars, and Mars in its orbit comes very near Antares. And in the old days, they said that they were at the god of war and, that, and the opponent of Mars, that they would fight, right? Because they look, look the same. So Mars, an opponent of Mars, Antares. And uh, one of my favorite things to talk to the kids, especially when they come out to star parties, and I'm almost always doing it on Saturdays, uh, and if Saturn's in the sky, I say, what day of the week is it today? And then they say, Saturday. I said, yes, it's Saturn Day. Did you know that's what it's named for? And a lot of people just don't. And I say, what's tomorrow? Well, it's Sunday. Well, what do you think that is, right? And then for the rest of the days of the week, if you speak French or if you speak Spanish, those days are a little bit clearer. How do you say Monday in Spanish? Luna, Luna right? M Monday, Moon Day, right? That's Moon Day, okay. Tuesday, but that's after the uh, Anglo-Saxon god Tuer, 
two S, but back in the day, how do you say it in Spanish? Martes. Martes. That's Mars Day, Martes, right? Wednesday after the God, uh, we call it after the uh, Anglo-Saxon God Wedno, but again in Spanish, Mercoles, right? Mercury Day, right? And then Thursday, Thor, Thor's Day, the great God Thor, right? And, but it's actually Jupiter Day because in, in Roman it's Iovi, right? So it's, in, in Spanish, how do you say Thursday? Yeah, that, again, that's Jupiter Day. And then Friday, after the goddess of love, Anglo-Saxon god, Freya, right? Um, but in, in, in Spanish, Friday is Venus. Yeah, Venus Day, right? So a lot of people go, go through their lives and they don't know that the days of the week that they're in are named after what they see in the sky. So you just learned something, right? Had you come to my star party, it'd be the first thing you learned. Everyone has to learn that one. Come on out on Saturn Day, because that's what it means. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. And if you want, and if you want to look in the view master, come on, have a look. Okay, hold that. I had one of those when I was a kid. Yeah. And now, hold this. Here, put your hands around and push, push this in. Oh, okay. That's the light. Is it working? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, rotate it. Can switch it? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. There's seven shots. Oh, wow. Do you want to see the view master? Yes, I okay, sure okay, so it's got a light in it, so just press this bar. Oh, all right. Okay, reach around and press the bar with your finger. Oh, oh okay. That's hey, wow. I had to look at it. At a, at a this is actually very old. I had to, yeah, but mine didn't have a battery. Oh, well, I know that. This is, this is a rare one, yeah. This is a rare one, yeah. <laughs> now, why that second little picture that's up there with a, looks like an animal face? No, the, the little one, that's like a close-up yeah. of the comet that's inset. That inset. Okay. <laughs> it's just, you know, you could almost say it's got eyes, though. And then that it does kind of, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're going to be there on the 25th? Nice. Yep. Oh, and great. Then, thank you. Oh, you are very good. And also, and I really appreciate you, you know, like you gave me some opportunity also that uh, really big present to me, you know, that sharing the location. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, once we, once we down there, it's a bonus for watching this, this sky. That's a bonus. Of course. And plus, I really enjoy the. You know, it's the sound of the, the all kind of. Of nature. course, you hear the crickets yeah, yeah. and you hear frogs I, and you hear I, coyotes. I, yes, I told I told the the who's the woman, uh, uh, Irene. Yeah. And then I wish you come down there someday. And then she said, Yeah, that sounds really exciting. Bring her out. <laughs> Bring her out. She'll yeah. love it, right? Yeah.